So I'm, I will start recording. Uh, welcome everybody to the second 2021 meeting of the Implicit Seminar. Tonight, uh, our guest is Joel David Hemkins, who will tell us about definability and the math the argument. Please do. Well, sure. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it's really a pleasure to be here and to see so many friends and colleagues. So, uh, right. So some of this material, in fact, most of it is uh, from a few years back. Um, and, uh, but I thought it would be fun to go through it and uh, to sort of talk through it slowly. So please feel free to interrupt with questions or whatever. Uh, I'm happy to discuss any part of it. Um, so, uh, right, okay, I wanna talk about the math, what I call the math T argument and the question specifically, must there be numbers we cannot describe uh, or define? And the math T argument uh, is the following. There must be real numbers that we cannot describe or define because there are uncountably many real numbers but only counted with many definitions. Is that a sound issue? My, uh, is something going on or? Almost surely someone hasn't uh, turned off their mic, uh, their speakers and their mic. So we have this. Yes, so please, infinite, everyone. So this infinite thing. Right, okay. Okay, so the question is, does this argument withstand scrutiny? I think uh, maybe I've heard this argument dozens of times at various math, in various math contexts, usually given informally, but people are quite serious about it. And so I wanna take the argument seriously. Um, and uh, when I first started thinking about this, I told my son Horatio, who at the time was eight, uh, and he said, well, I can describe any number let me show you. you, you tell me a number and I'll tell you a description of it, which of course is a completely devastating uh, response, <laughs> I think, but okay, so notwithstanding, let's proceed. Okay, so what does it mean to say that an object is definable in a structure? Of course, the logicians are expert in this. Uh, an object in a structure is definable if it's the unique object in that structure satisfying some property expressible in the language of the structure. So phi of x is true in the structure, just in case x is r, uh, that means that the object r is definable in the structure. And, and I'm talking about definability without parameters here. Okay, so a definable object, of course, then is an object in a, in a structure that has a property that only it has, only it in that structure has that property. Okay, so we can start very easily with some easy examples. If we think about the real continuum, uh, the real number line with just the order of structure only, then of course nothing is definable because uh, we can translate any point to any other point and that's an isomorphism of the structure with itself. And so any two points are automorphic um, and the point is that uh, automorphisms have to fix definable elements, of course. And so if I can move every element, then there can't be any definable elements in the structure. Okay, here's another simple example, the additive group of integers. If I have the integers with plus, then of course I can define the number zero. It's the additive identity uh, that has a quantifier. It's actually quantifier free definable as the only additive item potent. So zero is the only number that when added to itself gives itself back. Um, uh, but it's the only definable number because negation is an automorphism of this group with itself and it doesn't fix anything except for zero. So if we have the additive structure there, then only zero is definable. Okay, what about in the integer ring? If we have addition, and multiplication, then of course we can define the number one. It's the unique multiplicative identity and zero is the unique additive identity. And we can define two as one plus one, of course, and one plus one plus one is gonna define three and we can get the negatives because they are the additive inverses of the other objects. And so in the integer ring, every integer is definable in that structure. And that's what it means to say that a structure is pointwise definable. So to be pointwise definable means that every individual is definable without parameters uh, by a property expressible in the language of that structure. Well, if we think about the real field, the ordered real field, so we have the real numbers with plus and times and the order structure there. Of course, we don't need the order structure. It's definable algebraically from the algebraic structure because X is less than Y just in case 
if I add a non-zero square to x, I get y. And so, uh, so I never really need this less than, um, I, I can do it all just in the ring, in the field structure, in the algebraic structure. So which reals are definable there? And um, of course, every individual integer is definable there just like before. And also therefore every rational number is definable there because x is n over m, just in case it solves an equation like this which is expressible in the language. But of course, also the square root of two is definable. It's the, the positive thing, which is squaring to the number two. Um, and every algebraic number is definable because every algebraic number solving uh, uh, is a root of an integer polynomial. And it's, the, it's either the smallest root or the next smallest root and so on, the kth root in order of the roots of that polynomial. And so therefore we can define any particular real algebraic number. Um, but in fact, we can define only those in that structure. And this is a consequence of Tarski's theorem on uh, the elimination of quantifiers for real quotes fields. Uh, so Tarski proved famously that in the, in the ordered real field, every formula is equivalent to a quantifier free formula. Um, and in fact, he proved it not just in this field, but for any real closed field. Um, and you can start to see why that, how that could be true if you think about this sort of asserting that a certain quadratic has a real root is equivalent to the assertion that the discriminant is not negative. And this, so, so we eliminated this quantifier. We got rid of X. We don't have to talk about X. We can just talk about A, B, and C. So this is a quantifier free formula that is equivalent to this formula in any real closed field. Um, and Tarski proved that every formula uh, eliminates quantifiers in that way. Um, and then it follows from that, that uh, if you just take the real algebraic numbers, then this is a real closed field. And so therefore Tarski's uh, quantifier elimination works in the algebraic numbers. And so any number that's definable in the real numbers will also be definable in the algebraic numbers and therefore must itself be algebraic. Um, and, uh, and the algebraic numbers will be an elementary substructure of the real numbers because the quantifier free formulas, uh, uh, of course it's a substructure. And so the quantifier free formulas will be respected. Okay, so therefore in the real field, it's exactly the algebraic numbers that are definable um, there. Okay, now there's a related concept for pointwise definability, uh, what's called Leibnizian models. This was terminology introduced by Ali Eniyab, uh, and I really like it a lot. So a, a model is Leibnizian, um, uh, if any two distinct points have different properties. So if I have A and B different objects, then there should be some formula that distinguishes them. So phi of A is true, but phi of B is not true. So it's uh, sort of instantiating Leibniz's principle on indiscernibles. Um, uh, uh, Okay, so we can compare then pointwise definability is saying every individual has a property that only it has. Uh, Leibnizian says any two different individuals have different properties. So they seem kind of similar and it's fun, I think, uh, to consider whether these are the same property or not. Um, so let's think about that a little bit. Of course, any pointwise definable model will be Leibnizian because if every individual has a property that only it has, then if I have two different individuals, then of course, each of them has a property that the other one doesn't have. And so the structure is going to be Leibnizian. Um, so really the question is the converse. Um, so to answer that question, let's, let's just think about the ordered real field. Here we, here we have a structure, the real field, uh, and it's Leibnizian because if I have two different real numbers, then of course one of them is smaller and there's a rational number in between them. And so the larger one is bigger than that rational number, but the smaller one is smaller than that rational number. And those are properties that are expressible in the language of fields with the order which is expressible. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, and therefore the, uh, uh, 
this structure is Leibnizian because for any two real numbers, one of them is going to be bigger than a certain rational number and the other one isn't. And that's a property that will tell those two individuals apart. But it can't be Leibnizian. I mean, sorry, it can't be pointwise definable um, because uh, it's uncountable, but there's only countably many definitions. Uh, and so it can't be that every individual has a definition because there aren't enough definitions. So that's really a successful instance, I think, of the math T argument, namely the math T argument was saying there must be numbers we can't define because there's only countably many definitions but uncountably many reals. And that's the argument that we just used here to show that the real field uh, is not pointwise definable. Okay. Now, let me take a little detour. Is there a Leibnizian structure with no definable elements? The real field, okay, it wasn't pointwise definable, but it had a lot of definable elements. All the algebraic numbers were definable there. Um, and so this is an interesting question to play around with. And it's not too difficult to come up with examples, but what makes maybe a more interesting version of the question would be to do so in a finite signature in a finite language, then it's a, uh, a little harder puzzle um, that I want to show you an example. Uh, so let's consider this structure, the integers uh, under the integer order here um, uh, with a random unary predicate. So I'm, I have a unary predicate, so some of the integers uh, are in A and some of them are not, and I'm going to choose A by flipping a coin separately for each individual integer. And that's how I decide the predicate. Okay, so really there's a probability space and so on. And I'm gonna have measure one sets and measure zero sets and so on. And so I'm picking an A uh, from a suitable measure one set. Um, so let's, that, that's gonna be my st structure, a random predicate on the integer order. Uh, so let's think about this. Um, if A is not periodic, of course, almost surely it's not periodic because if it were periodic, it would have to have some period, but I have a lot of chances by flipping the coin to, to not have that period. And so almost surely I'm not periodic. So the random one is not gonna be periodic. And that's all it takes to be Leibnizian because if I have two different integers, if I think about the integer and what is the, what is the A pattern as I go up from that integer or down? It can't be that two different numbers have the same pattern because that would force A to be periodic. The period would be the difference between those integers. So if, I, if it's not periodic, then for any two points, the pattern of being in A or out of A can't be the same as I move away from those points. And that's a property that's expressible. And therefore, for any two different points, um, one of them is going to have a property. One of them is going to think, well, the 17th guy above me is in A, but the other guy isn't going to think that, or where 17 is chosen suitably. OK, um, so therefore, it's Leibnizian. We can tell any two integers apart. But I claim it's not. It has no definable elements. And, and to see this, well, suppose that some property were true of some integer phi of n. Then I claim the, the probability of that, I mean, in my probability space, the probability that phi of n was true has to be positive because there's only countably many formulas phi and only countably many n. And if all of those things had probability zero, uh, then um, uh, then uh, I can assume my the the that's a that's a measure zero event which I wouldn't be in if I'm if I'm picking a randomly and therefore it must be that this probability is positive if it happened. Um, but in that case, um, by homogeneity, of course, the, the the measure space is is translation invariant. It's homogeneous. I mean, the likelihood of something happening at any given point is the same no matter which point you use. Um, and therefore, the probability that phi of n has to be equal to the probability that phi of m is true. And so I've got sort of infinitely many chances to make this guy true. So almost surely phi is going to hold um, of, uh, of, of many different n's here. OK. Um, and, and so uh, so therefore, phi isn't going to hold only of that one n. And so there won't be any definable elements. 
Um, okay, so notice that this structure is rigid because that's just following from the, um, the non-periodicity. It's non-periodic, so there can't be any, any automorphisms of the structure. So it's, it's rigid, meaning that it has no non-trivial automorphisms, but it has no definable elements at all. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting combination, I think. Okay, so this is an example in a finite language of a Leibnizian structure with no definable elements. Okay, so let's go back now uh, up to the math T argument. Now we wanna add more structure. We had the real field, but let's look at the trigonometric real field where we add the, say the sine function as an additional function symbol to the signature. Now, of course, we can define the number pi because that has to do with the zeros of the sine function. Um, and, uh, and therefore we can define the integers as a subset now because it's just the, the multiples of that number pi, the, the integer multiples of pi are the zeros of the sine function. And so therefore um, uh, we can define the integers there. And therefore it follows of course that the theory of this structure is not decidable because we can interpret arithmetic in there. And uh, um, so by the halting problem and so on, it won't be a decidable theory, unlike the real field without the trig function, that theory is decidable as a consequence of Tarski's theorem, right? So Tarski, Tarski's theorem on real closed fields implies that the theory of the real closed field, I mean, of the reals um, is decidable. Uh, so it, when you add the sine function, it's definitely not decidable. Okay, so what are the definable reals here? Well, of course, once we have the integers as a predicate, then we can define any arithmetically definable real, and in fact, any projectively definable real. Um, and these functions are themselves projectively definable. And so therefore the definable reals of this structure are exactly the projectively definable reals. Um, okay, in particular, well, of course, every computable real number will be definable. That's very low complexity in the arithmetic hierarchy, right? Um, but so much more than that, much more than just the computable reals. All those reals are gonna be definable in this structure. Okay, so the general lesson is that as you add more resources to the language, then you you expect to get more and more definable reals. Nothing was definable with just the order. Then we got the algebraic numbers in the real field and we got the projective reals when we added some trig functions and other things, we're gonna get more. Uh, of course, even more reals will be definable if we go into this sort of set theoretic structure, H omega two, the, the sets of hereditary size at most omega one, um, that can define anything that's definable here because this structure is itself definable in H omega two. Or maybe we wanna iterate the power set five times or infinitely many times and look at uh, sort of defining reals in here is essentially looking at fifth order logic uh, over the natural numbers. Um, and so those are the fifth order definable real numbers, the ones that you can define in, inside here. Um, okay, or we could go up to the, this canonical Zermelo universe where the omega order um, or finite order for any finite order, uh, those are the reals we can define there. Okay, and so on. So one might look at say the real number 0 0.110, whatever it is, the pattern is following exactly the GCH pattern at the Aleph n. So we, we let the nth bit be one if the generalized continuum hypothesis holds at Aleph sub n, you know, it may or may not hold, right? So you have to look up high in the set theoretic universe to find out what the nth bit is. Okay, but this is in a sense, a definable real number. In fact, it's definable in this structure here. This is one of the definable reals that really uses the full height of this structure um, because in order to know about the Aleph ends, you have to get quite high. Um, okay, so, uh, right. So in trying to define more objects, it seems we're inevitably drawn to expand the language and extend the structure, we wanna add, a, consider a bigger structure, a bigger context, possibly a bigger language. But of course it's cheating to take that 
too seriously. For example, we wouldn't want to say, well, yeah, I'm going to define this number r, and it's the value of the constant symbol r, where I am considering the structure in which that constant is interpreted by that real number that I wanted to make definable. That's completely cheating, right? If you define a real number in terms of a language and in a structure in which the constant is simply picking out that real number, then you haven't really defined the number. Um, uh, okay, so a constant with value r, or maybe there's a unitary relation that holds only of this one real number. And so to define a real number using that relation seems like cheating, unless you can also somehow define the relation itself. Um, or to define objects in some V alpha, some rank initial segment of the set theoretic hierarchy at a level alpha that is not itself definable is also cheating because it's in effect using that, that height alpha as a parameter. Um, and it might enable you to define things even though you can't define the structure that you're defining the thing in. Please interrupt with questions, uh, feel free, because, uh, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're pushed to allow only countable languages. I think it's natural to consider countable or possibly even only finite languages. And furthermore, to consider only structures that are themselves definable in the set theoretic background. I think anything less than that is counting as cheating. Um, Okay, so let's go back to the math T argument. There must be real numbers we cannot describe or define because there are uncountably many real numbers but only countably many definitions. Um, so does it withstand scrutiny? And my answer is that it's complicated. Um, and so let's talk about what I mean. Okay, in a fixed structure, in a countable language, everything is completely fine and we've already explained it. So if I have if I have a fixed set structure M and I have, and it's got a countable signature, there's only countably many definitions. And so there must be real numbers that are not definable in that structure. Okay, that seems completely clear. We can associate each definable object with a formula that defines it. Uh, and we get this definability map that associates the definition with the object that it's defining. Because it's a set structure, we have a, we have a truth predicate for that structure. And so we can form that map, that definability map that associates the definition to the object that it defines. And then I can diagonalize against those definitions to produce a real number that's not definable in that structure. Okay, was there a question or I wasn't quite sure. Okay, so when defining reals though over the full set theoretic universe, which is somehow how we were pushed, that was the direction we we're pushed, then there's a subtle metamathematical obstacle. And that is that the property of being definable in V is not a first order expressible property in set theory. There's no, there's no set theoretic formula that says X is a definable object in the set theoretic universe. It's sort of, it's very closely related to Tarski's theorem on the non-definability of truth. We just don't have a way to express X is defined by formula phi um, unless we have a truth predicate, but we can't express the truth predicate or the satisfaction predicate in first order set theory. Um, so we don't really have access to that definability map there. So, 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 yes. So you, you wanted to ask questions. So here is a simple one. Is this equivalent to Tarski? Oh, I see. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've often said it's very closely related. Um, and well, I guess, okay, they're both true. So they're equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not what you meant, but um, so what would be the sense in which, yeah, what kind of equivalence would one want here? Um, well, just from this formulation to derive Tarski in two lines. No, they're not equivalent because uh -huh. I'm gonna show later that there are models of set theory in which there is a definable, uh, right. in which the class of definable objects is definable, but truth is not definable in the model. And that's Tarski's theorem, right? So, uh, so there are contexts that can separate the notions a little bit. Mm. Okay. There's no uniform definition is the real theorem here. Tarski says in any model, there's never a definition of truth in the model, right? Um, but that's not gonna be true for this 
uh, situation here. Okay, so okay, so the key subtle part of the argument of the math T argument, the key problematic part of it is that if we're in a context where we lack the association of the definition with the object, then we can't perform the diagonalization that is needed in order to produce the real number that's not definable. And that is the context in which you're in if you're trying to consider definitions with respect to the full set theoretic background. Okay, so here's another more forceful objection to the math T argument. And that is, if the math T argument were correct, then you might expect that it would work in any model of set theory because it's a mathematical argument and we're we're using set theory as our foundation, so it should work inside any model of set theory. And so that would lead you to expect that in any model of ZFC, there must be real numbers that are not definable in that model. Um, but that's not true. And that's really what I wanna to prove to you. There are models of set theory in which uh, it's not true uh, that, that there are real numbers that are not definable. Okay, so in fact, uh, there's an abundance of pointwise definable models of set theory so these are models in which every set, in particular, every real number, every topological space, every function, every everything is definable without parameters in that model. Okay, so it's relatively consistent with the axioms of CFC. Of course, that's a kind of ambiguous way to say it. Okay, that everything is definable because this statement is not expressible. So it's not really correct to say that it's relatively consistent with the axioms that that thing is true. What I really mean here is that there are pointwise definable models of CFC, if there are any at all. Okay, so I'm gonna give several proofs. So here's a kind of easy folklore proof. Um, uh, so if CFC is consistent, then there are continuum many non-isomorphic pointwise definable models. So here's the quick and easy way to do it. Um, so consider any model of ZFC plus V equal hod. So that's the axiom that's equivalent to the assertion that there's a definable well ordering of the universe of the set theoretic universe. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a strong definability uh, axiom. So for example, if V equal L is true, then V equal hod is also true. And so this includes the, any instance of the constructible universe. Um, and the key thing about that is when you have a definable well ordering of the universe, then you have definable skolem functions. Um, because if there is something, then there's a least thing with respect to that well order. And therefore there's a definable skolem function. And so the models, the set theoretic models of V equal hod, the model theory of models of ZFC plus V equal hod share many, many features of the model theory of piano arithmetic precisely for that reason, uh, as, as Ali Eniyat can uh, surely attest to, I think, and has said many times. Um, the, there's many similarities between the sort of analysis of PA models and analysis of models of set theory, provided you know V equal hub. And, and a lot of that comes from the fact that there's these definable skolem functions. Okay. If you have a model of V equal hard, then if you look at the definable elements in that, inside that model, then it's closed under the Skolem functions because the Skolem functions are definable without parameters. And therefore the set of definable elements satisfies the, uh, uh, the tarski bond criteria. And therefore it's an elementary substructure. And so therefore the definitions still work inside that model but everything in that model was definable. So the collection of definable elements in a model of V equal hard is itself a pointwise definable model of ZFC. Okay, that's the key idea. So in particular, if I, have, if I think about this theory ZFC plus V equal hard and I take any completion of it at all, um, uh, then if I take a model of that, then I'm gonna, if I take the definable elements of it, I'm gonna get a pointwise definable model. And there's continue many different completions uh, of that theory by the, by the Gödel roster and completeness theorem. And therefore uh, I've got continue many different pointwise definable models of CFC this way. Then in fact, it's more than that because pointwise definable models that have the same theory 
are actually isomorphic because any object in one of the models is definable, but the other guy also thinks there's such a thing because the theory was the same. And so that tells you how to make the isomorphism. So, so two different pointwise definable models, if they're elementary equivalent, then they're isomorphic, right? That's the point. And so therefore these models that we produced in this theorem are all and only the pointwise definable models of ZFC. You know, they all arise exactly this way. Okay, so here's, the, those models were maybe not transitive, but I wanna get a transitive model, a well-founded model of a pointwise definable model. And so the theorem is that if there's a transitive model of CFC, then in fact, there's, there's continuum many uh, pointwise definable transitive models of CFC. So here's a proof. Um, so fix any transitive model of CFC plus V equal hard. For example, if you have any transitive model of CFC, then go to its L, that's gonna be a model of V equal hard, or you can force V equal hard over it or something. Um, so the definable elements of that model form an elementary substructure whose, whose Minsovsky collapse is pointwise definable. Uh, and that's, that gives you one transitive model, one pointwise definable transitive model of CFC. You know. But I wanna make continuum many. And so what I'm gonna do is force over that model N, I add a Cohen real generically over it. And then of course we know how to force V equal hot over any model by coding sets into the continuum pattern, into the GCH pattern. You can, you do a long iteration and you force basically randomly the GCH to hold or fail. And then it happens that every set in the structure is eventually coded into the GCH pattern in the forcing extension. Um, and so uh, in that extension, you'll have a model of V equal hard. The forcing extension will be a model of V equal hard. And I can also make sure that C itself is definable without parameters by making sure that that Cohen real that I added was specifically coded into the, say, the GCH pattern at the Aleph ends. Um, and uh, okay, so now the definable elements of this forcing extension will include that real C and it will be pointwise definable. Uh, and now we just observe, well, look, there's continuum many different C's that I can add that way. There's a perfect set of Cohen reals over any countable model. Um, and so I get continuum many, continuum many different models that way. And they're different because they, they have these different Cohen reals that were added and coded at the Aleph ends. Okay, so we have a lot of pointwise definable models. So here's another one. The minimal transitive model of CFC is pointwise definable. Um, so the minimal, this is known as the Shepherdson Cohen model. It's the smallest L alpha, the smallest initial segment of the constructability hierarchy, which is a model of CFC. If there's any transitive model of CFC, then its L is gonna be such an L alpha. And so there's gonna be a smallest one and that's the minimal model. This is the model that Cohen used when he was first introducing forcing. He was forcing over this minimal model and he thought that that was very important to do. But we realized later, said there's realized later that, it, that it, forcing is more general than that. Um, but it was also known to Shepherdson earlier um, the, the study of this model. I just wanna point out that it's pointwise definable um, and it's easy to see. Um, because if I take the definable whole of the empty set here, in other words, I'm taking the definable elements of this model, that's, a, uh, that's an elementary substructure of it. So it, it, uh, it, I can look at the Mostovsky collapse that's uh, collapsing to some L beta, but beta can't be less than alpha because alpha was minimal. So therefore it has to collapse to itself. Um, and what that shows is that uh, everything in L alpha is definable in L alpha because it is the Mostovsky collapse of its definable elements. Um, so therefore this model is pointwise definable. And the next one is also the next model and the next one after that and so on. If you have a pointwise definable model of CFC in some L alpha, then the next L beta that's a CFC model is also pointwise definable and you can iterate, but there's gaps and so on. It's quite interesting and complicated and fun to look at. Okay, so now I wanna sort of switch gears a little bit um, because the, the hot based arguments were achieving pointwise definability by throwing things away you, you took the definable elements, basically you kept the definable elements and you threw everybody else away. 
And then you said, well, what's left is a pointwise definable model. And I want to take a different kind of attitude now and keep everything that I had, but still produce pointwise definability. Um, so I want to achieve definability by adding new elements. OK, so the theorem is uh, every countable model of ZFC, and in fact, it's generalized to Gödel Bernays set theory, also has a pointwise definable class forcing extension. So this was observed by Enayat in, in 2005, and it was uh, proved independently by myself and David Linitsky and Jonas Reitz. OK, so uh, right. So let's talk about the proof. So every countable model of ZFC has a pointwise definable class forcing extension. So the, the sketch is we start with that countable model of ZFC. Uh, and the first step is to use this theorem of Simpson. Steve Simpson had proved earlier that it's possible to find a generic class of ordinals, generic for the forcing that adds a generic class of ordinals with set conditions, um, such that the resulting class forcing extension is pointwise definable. But this is not a model of set because we're adding this predicate u, right? So, so he's making a pointwise definable model of set theory, but he's adding this, this predicate u, which is making all the definitions work. So let me just explain how that goes. It's really a quite remarkable argument. It's a countable model. So you can enumerate the objects, the sets of the model, you enumerate them. And also there's only countably many definable dense classes in the forcing. So we look at dense class, dense subclasses of the forcing that are definable with parameters. And we can assume the parameters needed in D sub K are amongst the objects that had already appeared. Okay, so the, the, it's a slow enumeration in the sense that the parameters that you need to define the next one are already there on the list earlier. Okay, and now what you do is you build you just by hand, you, you take the smallest possible condition in the first dense set, the shortest possible one. And then immediately after that, you code with a, with a binary sequence, because th basically you as a binary sequence, ordinals are either in or out. So you're putting on some big binary sequence. You can code any set you want that way. So first you get into D zero and then you code A zero after that in such a way that you can tell when the coding is done. Now you've got a binary sequence. Then you get the shortest possible extension of that that's in the next dense set. And then you code A1 after that and so on. You iterate this. Now this, the resulting U that you build that way is going to be generic because you got into all the dense classes. But also the point is that, oh, I'm sorry, uh, from U, you can define all these A's because these D's are themselves definable. And so if you, if you have a definition of D zero, then you can tell what the shortest initial segment of U is that's in it. So you know where the coding point of A zero started and then you can extract A zero from U. Yeah, and then you, you know that D one is definable using parameters you already have. And therefore you look at the smallest initial segment of U that gets into D one. And so you know where the coding of A1 starts and so on. So using this predicate U, you can get back all these sets A sub I. Um, and that's how the Simpsons proof goes. Okay, so we added this generic class. It's kind of funny because we're forcing to add U. And normally when you think about forcing, you think about the generic filter as being totally random generic set that you have no control over and it's not giving you any extra information. But this one is giving you huge amounts of extra information because it's giving you codes for all of the elements of your model. It's making the model pointwise definable. Um, and it's still generic because we got into all the dense classes here, right? So it's kind of remarkable. There's a tension going on in that construction. Okay, so the second step is once you have U now, this is really the extra part beyond Simpson's theorem that gets this theorem. Namely, you force with what's called self-encoding forcing. So we know how to make a given set definable by forcing. We can code it into the GCH pattern. Now, the self-encoding forcing is a kind of catch-your-tail argument. So you add a set 
and then you code it into the GCH pattern, but now you added a whole bunch of new stuff. So you need to code that into the GCH pattern, but now you added more stuff. So you need to code that into the GCH pattern and so on. But in Omega many steps, then everything that you added is eventually coded into the GCH pattern. And so you've self encoded the generic filter itself. You produce a forcing extension in which the original target set is definable and also the whole forcing extension stuff that you added is also definable from ultimately from the GCH pattern. So we can code U and also G. And so the result is that in the forcing extension M of G, U is definable and all these A sub I's are definable and G is definable. And so everything in M of G is going to be definable. So that's a pointwise definable class forcing extension of the original model M. Okay, so we also extended this to Gödel Bernays set theory. So this is um, a set theory where we have both sets and classes. It's a second order set theory. It's not full second order set theory, but we have uh, two, you can think of it as two sorts. We have the sets and then we have the classes. So models of GBC have this form. There's a first order domain M and that's gonna be a model of ZFC. And then there's a collection of classes, a subset of the power set of M which are the classes. And then we have a class comprehension axiom, but only for first order assertions there. Um, uh, if you wanted class comprehension for second order assertions here, then you get what's called uh, Kelly Morse set theory, which is strictly stronger. Um, GBC is conservative over, over ZFC, um, but Kelly Morse set theory is strictly stronger. Okay, so for the GBC case, the theorem is that every countable model of GBC has a pointwise definable extension where every set and also every class is definable without parameters, first order definable without parameters. And let me just tell you a little bit about it. So even when we augment the ZFC model with these classes, maybe some of them are not definable originally, but we can make them definable by adding more classes and more sets. So, in the end, we're gonna produce just a ZFC model, but then the, the parameter free definable classes of that model will make a GBC model that includes all of the old classes. Okay, so we wanna make this extension where every set in class is definable. So the idea is we start with the GBC model and then the key first step, which is what makes this more difficult than the ZFC case is that um, we turn it into a principal extension. So this is a GBC model that has a class from which all the other classes are definable. Okay, it's not necessarily true because if, if you take a GBC model and then you do class forcing over it and then class forcing again and again and again, Omega many times and just take the union of everything that you get, then you won't have a principal GBC model because any set that appears was there at some stage and the things that are definable from it are just the things that were there already at that stage and not the things that were generic over it. So it's easy to make non-principal GBC models. Um, but in fact, every GBC, every countable GBC model can be turned into a principal GBC model. And it's something like collapsing the power set of ORD to ORD. Basically it's this metaclass forcing to unify um, the construction. Um, it, uh, yeah, we appeal at a certain place. I'm just noticing uh, Schmerl and Kosick and everybody here. So we use your, your arguments for that uh, part and it's in the paper and cited. Okay. So once we have this principal extension, then we have that one class from which all the other classes are definable. Then we can just do something like the ZFC argument, but relative to that class. So we do the Simpson thing, but now we have both X and U that we need. Uh, and then uh, and then we do the self-encoding forcing to code X and U and G, and then we get the final forcing extension, uh, which is now just gonna be a ZFC model and it can unpack the entire construction. Okay, so, so now I wanna, uh, um, so get away from the details of that technical argument and return to the math T argument. So underlying the math T argument is the presumption that we can associate every definition to the object it defines. It's a key part. Um, and the point is that this isn't always true. Um, so let me discuss the sort of range of possibility that can happen. And this is related to uh, Roman's question earlier. 
first of all, there can never be, a, there's no uniform definition of the class of definable elements. And you can't have a formula in set theory, which is always picking out the definable elements um, uh, because there are pointwise definable models that have elementary extensions. And the pointwise definable models think everything's definable, but the elementary extensions don't. Uh, so, so you can't have any such formula that always picks out the definable elements. Um, secondly, in some models, the class of definable elements is definable. For example, in a pointwise definable model, the class of definable elements is everything, and that's a definable class. So you can sometimes define the class of definable elements because sometimes it's everything. Um, so in others, the definable elements do not necessarily form a class. For example, if you start with a pointwise definable model and then take an ultra power of that model, then the definable elements of the ultra power will just be the range of the ultra power map but that's never definable inside a non-trivial ultra power. So therefore that's a case where the definable elements are not definable as a class. Um, so you can have the definable elements forming a class, but without having the definability map. Uh, and that's true in a pointwise definable model because the definable elements are everything, which is a class, but the definability map isn't definable because then you could do the math T argument. Um, the definable elements can be a set along with that definability map. And that's gonna be true if I have a model V in which some rank initial segment is actually elementary in V, then the definable elements are just the definable elements of V gamma. Um, and that exists in V because V has a truth predicate for V gamma and it can pick out the definable elements and so on. <clears throat> okay. No model ever has a definable definability map uh, because you could diagonalize against it. Okay, so the surviving content of the math T argument seems to be that in any model that has access to this definability map, then the definable reals do not exhaust all the reals. I wanna make this observation um, about sidestepping Russell's objection to Frege right, the Russell paradox. Um, okay, in a pointwise definable model of GBC, we actually have a definable one-to-one -one correspondence between sets and classes. And I wanna tell you what I mean by that. Okay, it's very common to interpret the Russell theorem as saying, look, you can't ever have a definable bijection between sets and classes because this contradicts Cantor's theorem that the power set is bigger and so on, right? So the idea of course is that Russell, Russell says, well, look, if you had, that map, you can make the class of all objects that are not in the associated class. And that can't be equal to any of those classes because A is in the Russell set, Russell class, if and only if A is not in XA. So this would be a new class. Yeah, that, that's the Russell argument, right? It seems to refute what I said here that we can have a definable one-to-one -one correspondence. And let me explain what I mean by this now. Uh, so my model sidesteps this because the definition here is a second order definition, but these are GBC models. And so we can't make the Russell class because the association of A with XA is definable in the model, which has that second order part, but it's a second order definable association of sets with classes. And we only have first order class comprehension. And so we cannot form the, the Russell class to make the contradiction happen. So we have a definable association, but we can't do the Russell class because we don't have the map. I'm sorry, because we can't, we, we can't, ex we, this would be an instance of second order comprehension, but we're only in Gödel Bernays. We only have first order comprehension. So we can't make this class R. Okay, so, so actually we don't, to, to do this argument, you don't actually need anything about pointwise definability. It works in any GBC model in which every class is first order definable, even with parameters, we can do the, a version of this argument. There's a second order definable association of sets with classes inside any such model. Um, and it doesn't contradict, it sidesteps Russell because the Russell class that you would wanna define uh, would, would require second order comprehension, but you only have first order comprehension. I thought that was interesting. Um, and it, I think what it reveals is a subtle definability issue in the, the Frege-Russell interaction that you don't often hear about. I mean, you give Russell's argument, 
but I haven't heard people talk so much about the complexity of the of the map that associates every set with a class. So if if Frege's, for example, extension operator was second order definable, then Russell's argument wouldn't work if we only had first order class comprehension. Okay, so let me just summarize. Uh, okay, when if we're seeking to define more and more real numbers, then we're pushed to enlarge our context by considering larger structures or higher order descriptions. And in any fixed context, then of course, there's only countably many definable objects, but the full context of definability in V uh, is not actually expressible. And so for all we know, every object in the universe is uniquely describable, uh, but we wouldn't be able to know that. We can't even express it in a single statement. Um, and, and even if it isn't true, then we could maybe hope to enlarge our universe to make it true by forcing or something. We could uh, arrive in that state where every object is actually definable. Um, and so ultimately, I suppose my son Horatio was right, uh, but only possibly in an extension of the universe. So, okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, so, are there any questions? I think I have a question, but I can wait until. Uh others pose their questions. So I think that you, you should go on. Okay. Um, I guess my first one is, is more like a comment slash question and has to do with Horatio. Uh, so um, when you presented the argument, uh, because Horatio, uh, well, how old was Horatio when he asked, when he answered you in the way he did? Oh, he was eight years old. Only. Well, that's right, he was eight. And because my son was also very contrarian and he still is a, uh, but the contrarian aspect of, uh, is what I, um, if, if I take this as a positive, as opposed to a negative uh, uh, reading, is that Horatio's conception of real numbers at that age, perhaps, uh, maybe he still is, is a predicative one. He, he, he right. basically uh, was, was saying, give, basically he was asking you to give a definition of some characterization of a real number because he, he was asking you for one. Right. Uh, yeah, so he said, you know, you give me any number and I'll tell you a description of it, right? And so yes, it, yes. So how could you give him that number, right? Uh, yeah. Except by defining it, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, but um, so um, my other question is uh, kind of more technical and it has to do with, I think, a question which I believe was open, uh, left open when you wrote um, um, your paper with uh, Reitz and Linetsky on, on the topic, which is, is it true, is it known, I should say, whether the result that you proved for GBC uh, also perhaps could work for uh, Kelly Morse models, that every countable Kelly Morse model can be extended. To right. Point. Yeah. So the methods just fail uh, for that. So I don't, I don't know the answer. And I think it's a quite difficult one. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's time to revisit that. Uh, I think it's really an interesting question, actually. I don't know the answer and I don't know. So it's, it's a good one to, to yeah. revisit, I guess. For, uh, yeah, I think definitely it's worth revisiting. So the question would be, does that, is every countable Kelly Morris model have a, have a say, a, a, for, a class forcing extension or any kind of extension that's pointwise definable? Um, and these coding methods uh, is, I guess we don't have a Simpson's theorem analog for Kelly Morse or, uh, or wait, let's see. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's the other result about coding. No, no, I think many... Simpson is still gonna work fine, right? Cause it's yeah. just countably many dense classes. You can still do, you can make all the sets definable. Yes. So let's see, the other step was to make it principle. Oh, Kelly Morse models are never principle. So right. That's, right. that's out the window, right? I mean, it, it's, they're provably yes. not principle because yes. you have a truth predicate for any class. So therefore you can't have a single class that defines all the other ones. I mean, with first order definitions, I guess you could hope that they're principle with second order definitions. Oh, so what do you mean? Do you want, is it okay if the classes are second order definable? I guess you have to have that, right? Yes, yes. It's just, yes. Otherwise it's just false, right? Right, so when exactly. you say point-wise definable model of kelly Moore set theory, then you should be asking for second order definitions, right? Exactly, exactly. Otherwise it's impossible, I think. Exactly, yes. Because of issues yes. related to Tarski's theorem. Yes. Um, 
So then you could hope to make it principal, but with second order, a second order version of principal, right? Because mm -hmm. that's going to be like collapsing P or to or. Um, I think maybe it, it might work. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I want to think about it. Because then the self-encoding forcing, that's going to be fine for Kelly Morris. So, uh, so I think, yeah, I want to think more about it now. Yeah, I'm more optimistic than I was. I thought it was hopeless, but uh, maybe it's because I was thinking before about wanting first order definitions, and that is truly hopeless. But if you interpret second order, maybe it's kind of cheating a little bit. Is it? I mean, if I have a model of set theory, of Kelly Moore set theory, then I've got a bunch of sets and I've also got a bunch of classes, right? Yes. And if I say pointwise definable, then I have to be allowed to quantify over the classes, right? Otherwise, I think it's provably false. And Precisely, yes, yes. So if you give yourself second order definitions, then maybe it's possible to just rework the arguments uh, along the same outline. You know, I wanna think about that. That's a great question. You know. What well, what happens to your um, your sidestepping Russell Frege argument in 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 that case? It seems like um, the class that you define well, it's actually it's, it it's actually a class in KM. Right? Yeah. So the 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 argument. I mean, the, the proof that there's a definable bijection between sets and classes in GBC if the model has every class definable. Um, is using the fact that the, that there are uh, that the sigma n truth predicates, the sigma n satisfaction classes, are implicitly definable uniformly in n. In other words, there's a there's a formula which is true of a class and a number n if and only if that class is a sigma n truth predicate, because it's just expressing the Tarski recursion up to level n. Yeah, and, and every model of GBC uh, has sigma n truth predicates for every standard n because we can define them uh, in the meta theory. Um, and, and therefore, if the model thinks that, I mean, if it's true of the model that every class is definable from parameters, then you can observe that as a second order property of the model. Um, but in Kelly Morris, this is just totally broken. We don't have, uh, um, I, I think, uh, we, yeah, in the, in the Kelly Morris case, we'd have to be using the second order definitions, but then the, the truth classes aren't predicates there. It's just the wrong type and everything. I think everything mm -hmm. goes wrong with it. Thanks. Okay, so maybe one question, comment, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> Mm, concerning the, 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 this Matti argument and what remains, uh, what remains, what is uh, uh, doubtful. Uh, so if I live, if I, I am an inhabitant uh, uh, of V, v Epsilon here, yeah. uh, then uh, what I can say, uh, and I do not need a notion uh, like an absolute notion of definability, what I can say uh, is that uh, if I uh, consider an arbitrary countable uh, uh, language uh, and uh, uh, an arbitrary model, uh, which is reasonable about reals, yeah, uh, then uh, there will be uh, undefinable reals in this model. Yeah, yes. if you mean say. a set model, yeah, it has to be yeah. a model for which you have a truth predicate. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the relation of satisfaction uh, in a model is definable. I can express sure. it. Sure. Yeah, for any set uh, so, structure, right? Yeah. So what is uh, really uh, it's different if, if you want to talk about something like absolute uh, 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 undefinability. Right. Uh, think like, so uh, perhaps one would like to say there is a real number, so it starts with existential quantifier. There is a real number such that no matter how I expand uh, my language, this real number uh, 
No, uh, that's not true. You can expand the language. Yeah, number, right? yeah, yeah, just a moment. Yeah. And uh, at this point, there is this uh, uh, restriction uh, that languages have to be reasonable. Yeah. Well, let's just uh, use the language of set theory, and then it's still not true because, in fact, it's a theorem of CFC that if there's an uncountable transitive model of CFC, for example, then every real is definable in a model of ZFC plus V equal L. That's just a mm -hmm. theorem. So you're not going to find a real that can't be definable anywhere. In fact, every real is going okay. to be definable in some structure. Um, so where does this, where really does this uh, uh, undefinability uh, intervenes? I mean, the fact that you cannot define uh, the notion of a definable language, yeah? It's because if I, want to speak about, I want to speak about models, then I can always say that given an arbitrary um, uh, uh, reasonable model, there will be a number which is not definable in this model. Right, I agree with all that, yeah. But to me, the issue isn't about defining the notion of definability so much as what seems core to the math C argument is having the association, the map of the definition to the real number that it's defining. And of course, okay, if you are talking about in a, in a particular structure, of course, then when we have a satisfaction class for that structure, then we can define that map. Uh, and it's gonna be a different map depending on which structure we're looking at. And so when we diagonalize against those reals, we're gonna be getting different reals in different structures and so on. But oftentimes the math argument is advanced by people who aren't quite so sophisticated as the people in this audience. Um, and, uh, and I don't think they're talking about a structure. They just want to talk about defining a real number in the way that mathematicians do. And we define real numbers by just giving a definition in CFC. Um, I mean, ultimately, that's how a set theorist views what they're doing. If I define a real number by some mathematical process and I haven't specified what the foundation is, then the presumption is that I'm doing so in some set theoretic background. Um, and so probably I'm doing it in CFC. And, and, then the, and then you're in the situation of the pointwise definable models of CFC case, I think, yeah. But otherwise, if you're talking about particular structures, then you're already more sophisticated than the math T argument, I think. And that's clearly the way out of the paradox. So I also have a question. Um, I'm interested to, uh, in what happens to the math T argument, um, in the case uh, when we try to um, formalize the um, uh, this informal notion of definability using this math T argument uh, on the basis of um, theories of truth as um, put forward by um, philosophical logicians. So you might know that there are quite right. a number of different uh, theories of truth there that are developed, for example, to tackle semantic paradoxes like the liar paradox and some of these right. theories of truth uh, go uh, outside the realm of classical logic in order to, um, like for example, the paracomplete um, theories of truth by by, by Hartree Field um, uh, that, that try to um, uh, have um, like the certain intuitive uh, reasoning with with a truth predicate, but then in order to avoid the paradox, uh, the, the the liar paradox, uh, you actually avoid some instances of the law of the excluded middle, for example. And I'm I'm wondering if, if one takes such a theory of truth, for example. Uh, and uses that to define, um, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, because then you, you have a notion of truth, so you can define definability using that notion of truth. Right. And what happens to the math T argument? Yeah, that's a really good uh, suggestion. I don't, I've never thought along those lines, but of course, I mean, there's all these different uh, theories of truth and what properties you might look for in a truth predicate, the T scheme and so on, and these different properties. Um, and usually the, the people who are doing that are not always talking about definability, but as you said, of course, if you have a theory of truth, then it's related, of course, to a theory of definability. But I wonder if one went directly for sort of axiomatizing the nature of definability, um, you know, and finding similar such axioms for definability rather than for the T uh, predicate. And uh, maybe, maybe it's hopeful, I'm not quite sure. I've never thought along those lines and I don't really have an answer to your question uh, other than that except that I find it interesting. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, yeah, I, I only have a remark. So the, so people have thought about reconstructing Frege using first what you call first order comprehension. So I think in this literature it's called predicative comprehension because you still oh, allow the, the second order variables in the formulas. Uh, sure, so does GBC though in in its comprehension axiom? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, precisely. So that that's yeah. what I call predicative comprehension, and, and so it's I a see. little bit of a, a confusion of of uh, definitions here. Um, and so the thing is, so that if you do Frege, so in the first round you get to to Q, and then in the second round you get to and if you then add again. The say it again, what? I don't quite. So, so start with nothing, right? And, and start with the classes, predicate comprehension, and the, and the Frege, and simply stipulate that there's this mapping, the Frege, what I call the Frege function. Then okay. you, you get. I mean, the epsilon, the extension operator, you mean, or what? Yeah, yeah, the extension operator. Okay. And so then the, in, in the first round, you get Q or, 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 or I delta zero plus omega one, or at least something of that strength. Oh, I see. And then in the second round, if you then repeat the procedure, you get uh, elementary arithmetic. So you, you go one up in consistency strengths at every round. And so you go up to the pi zero one consequences of I delta zero plus sup x. So you don't reach Soup X, but you you get at, the, at least up to the. Are you talking about the version of Frege, but just for arithmetic, or this sort of set theoretic version? Where no, no, have... it, you simply have nothing. You start with nothing. Okay. Plus classes and predicative comprehension, right? So there's no. So the idea of Frege was, of course, the, the Baron von Münchenhausen like thing that he he he, he, right. he he gets himself from the Morris with his wig. So you, you start with nothing and you get something from nothing, right? So that's the, that's the Frege thing. So you start with nothing and just the second order machinery and the, and the predicative or what you call first order comprehension. And then repeating that round after round, uh, omega times you get up to the pi zero one uh, consequences of sup exp. So that seems to be a kind of, natural limit for this kind of uh, foundational process. I see, interesting. So in the case of these, uh, this sort of model I was talking about at the end, the, the, the extension map, the Frege map that associates objects with classes is delta one definable. Um, mm -hmm. So, so there's a, it, which is it's just slightly beyond first. Right, order. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. The minimum possible use of the yeah. second order resources. Yeah. But if, in fact, so the, 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 the thing really saves Frege. Oh, you, 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 of course, you do not get far, right? Well, you get. Yeah, you can't, Frege. right? Because of Russell. So. Yeah, you get up to soup export is a kind of still, I, I, I thought, <laughs> impressive, but uh, yeah. So what's, the, what's the reference for this fact? I'm sorry, did you repeat over? Um, my analyst paper about this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know precise the pre well, you, you can find the reference. It's, uh, and I can send the reference if you wish. Yeah, I would like that if he sends it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please show me to the link. Oh, wait, well, if, if, you, if you go on talking a bit, I can find the reference and put it here in the in the thing, wait a moment. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Or it seems to me that what was uh, said earlier by Aviv so sounds interesting because indeed, if you add uh, like a satisfaction predicate yeah, to the language as, as, as primitive, then you can uh, uh, express the notion of definability 
some of these uh, problems disappear. Uh, well, then. You know, because once you have that predicate, then I want to look at definitions that use it. Yeah. And so it's that was a, that can, was exactly know. what what I, what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. So there's reals that are definable without it, but yeah. uh, you know yeah. that you that there are reals that aren't definable with that because mm -hmm. there's going to be pointwise definable models of ZFC equipped with a truth predicate, right? Yeah. You could write down the theory of what you mean by that, and uh, you're going to have pointwise definable models of that theory just as well, right? Okay, in the meantime, I found it. And so it's Thank in the so much, Albert. Let me just it. Yet. Yeah, so there's, there's still something missing in my paper. So uh, Alex Wilkie uh, discovered a hierarchy of functions that goes up to soup exp. So, uh, and, and so there's also a correspondence of this hierarchy with this hierarchy by Wilkie, but uh, I never got around to, uh, <laughs> to 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 writing that up. So it's uh, there. So the, so I I give you the connection with iterated consistencies, but there's also a kind of growing hierarchy of functions uh, uh, connected to that. But yeah, regrettably, it has been written nowhere. Okay, do we have other questions, remarks? I have one quick remark um, that I just uh, broke through once I heard the question from, uh, I think, uh, Marcus Kramer um, about truth theories and, and this topic that we're just discussing right now. Um, I just remember that um, if we look at the, uh, the, arith the second order theory of arithmetic known as ACA, so it's ACA, is stronger than ACA zero because it has full induction as opposed to ACA zero. Which, so ACA zero is like Gödel Bernay, but but ACA is a, as a scheme of induction over the natural numbers. Then um, that theory is well known um, to be um, to be mutually interpretable with a piano arithmetic plus an inductive truth predicate. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you if you consider uh, ACA plus the statement every real number is uh, def arithmetically definable, then you get an extension of ACA, um, which happens to be bi-interpretable with piano arithmetic with an inductive truth predicate. So we have on one hand a truth theory, piano arithmetic plus an inductive truth predicate, and a theory of second order arithmetic, uh, which asserts uh, every real number is pointwise definable. So there's at least that link that I just wanted to point out based on the question that was asked. I see that. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure this, this is just probably the beginning of a big, bigger set of interconnections between the two. I don't know exactly what happens in the GB context. I, I suspect something similar probably happens, but I haven't worked it through. But, but what I just told you uh, is something that I had worked through a number of years ago uh, in an unpublished manuscript. and. Uh, and Marcus's question just reminded me of it. Okay, other questions, remarks? If not, thank you, Joel, very much. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.